All right, welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, we're here to talk about plastic paralysis and particularly the uh, the perilous policy landscape, the future global regulatory landscape for uh, for plastic paralysis. Um, I'm Mike Coleman. I'm a senior vice president here at Lux and moderating today for our presenter, who is Anthony Schiavo, our senior director and principal analyst, and who's been doing uh, a lot of work on this uh, this uh, this topic over over the years. Freshly back from a, a presentation in, in in Houston at the Celeste Society of Plastic Engineers conference on the topic as well. Um, so we'll hear from him in just a moment, but throughout the webinar, uh, you can type any questions that you have into the questions box on your screen. We'll answer uh, as many as we can get to at the end here. But if your question doesn't get answered or you think of a great one afterwards, uh, go ahead and email those to questions at luxresearchinc.com and we will respond. So without any further ado, um, here's Anthony Schiavo. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about the future of policy for plastic pyrolysis. So we'll start with a little bit of an introduction, and then we will highlight four key areas of policies. And then I'll share my thoughts on what this all means for the, the future of, of plastic pyrolysis. I want to start here. Uh, why are we talking about pyrolysis at all? Why is this important? Um, plastic pyrolysis, you're probably familiar if you've joined this webinar, but it's a relatively high temperature process that converts mixed plastic wastes back into a oil uh, product. There's quite a wide range of variation here in terms of the actual technology at play, but that's what I would consider to be conventional pyrolysis. Why this matters is because when you look at global recycling rates for plastics, there's actually a very wide disparity between the different types of plastic. And in particular, you have a couple polyolefin plastics, polypropylene and low-density polyethylene, that have quite low recycling rates. Um, polypropylene globally, maybe 1% to 2% recycling rate. And that's 70 million plus uh, tons of material a year that we're talking about. So there's some really big gaps in the existing recycling ecosystem. And the chemical industry wants to plug those gaps with plastic pyrolysis. Um, However, plastic pyrolysis is not mechanical recycling. It turns plastic back into oil, and then that oil needs to be turned back into plastics. And that presents a couple issues. One, it tends not to fit the legal definition of recycling, which often excludes fuel or excludes processes that produce energy um, or otherwise specify mechanical recycling. And then two, there's a question of how do you actually account for the material that you're producing? So we have this issue of olefin mechanical recycling. We want to uh, fill that issue or solve that issue with plastic pyrolysis. But this creates the need for new policy and regulatory schemes. One of the big points of contention between regulators, you know, the plastics industry writ large, and uh, advocacy groups is on mass balance. Um, as well as the broader question of the energy intensity and the accounting of, of plastic pyrolysis. Um, so if you look here, you can see that the basic challenge is with plastic pyrolysis, in that initial process, if you take a ton of plastic waste, you're probably going to get about a 75% yield of oil. So three quarters of a ton of oil. The other 25% will mostly be burned to power the process there's a fair bit of carbon emissions that are practically being released by that. You're essentially incinerating 25% of the plastic. That's an issue. Then there are some yield losses to upgrading, but then the big challenge is that if you put your plastic in, or excuse me, you put your oil in a conventional uh, cracking unit or a conventional sort of polymer production facility, most of that barrel of oil is going to end up as fuel, right? About you know, maybe 80% to 90% is going to end up as fuel. Now, you can do a lot with your cracking to change that. Uh, there are certainly oil to chemicals uh, facilities that can achieve like a 40% conversion rate. But that's a big investment um, and, you know, kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about today. So, you know, 
in terms of your overall, if you're taking a ton of plastic waste, you're only getting out maybe 10 to 20 percent of a ton of polymer precursors, whether that's, you know, BTX or some type of uh, olefin precursor. Most of this is ultimately getting burned as energy, right? So how do you actually account for this, right? And mass balance is a type of uh, accounting or regulatory system that basically allows you to say, okay, we are going to take all these different parts, the things we're producing, you know, we're producing 20 tons of polymers, 60 tons of fuels, 20 tons of wax, and we're going to allocate all the recycled content into the plastic part. Um, that's under free allocation. It's very favorable to the chemicals industry. There are other ways of doing this. Proportionate allocation, that's a very sort of restrictive way of doing it. Um, you know, you have to do it based on the, the volume of material in. So if you're putting 10% uh, pyrolysis oil in, you can claim 10% of your content out at the end. There's other ways, fuel exempt. Um, you know, even more restrictive way, like a polymer only. So the, the point I want to make about all this is that the acceptance of these mass balance systems and the type of mass balance system that gets accepted, if indeed it does get acceptance, has very, very real ramifications for the revenue potential of plastic pyrolysis, right? If you uh, allow free attribution mass balance, that would, in our forecast, increase the effective yield of polymers by 14 million tons, or more than an order of magnitude, on about you know 20 million tons of uh, plastic pyrolysis capacity by 2030. So this is billions of dollars of revenue right at stake. It's the difference between being able to meet a content target, um, you know, for the industry broadly, like 15 million total tons of material is enough to get to an appreciable fraction of your polypropylene or your polyethylene market uh, having recycled content in it, certainly the food packaging applications, um, versus, you know, 1 million ton, you're not really able to meet those targets. So both the total revenues and the actual regulatory targets are very much hanging in the balance here based on these policy decisions. This is purely a policy output, uh, this, this chart that we're looking at and these 14 million tons. So that's just one example, but I want to show you that, you know, the policy here is very impactful. I really can make a difference in terms of the economics and the overall outlook for plastic pyrolysis. So with that in mind, there's three key, three key questions we need to answer. One is pyrolysis recycling. I mentioned earlier, it's different from mechanical recycling. It often falls afoul of existing laws and definitions. So we have to answer this question first. Then how do we actually track and manage the waste uh, management activity via pyrolysis. We have to be able to make certain claims. Even if pyrolysis is not recycling, we still need to be able to make certain claims about what's happening to that material. What are we producing at the end of it? Um, and we need a legal framework for being able to make those claims. And then lastly, and this is kind of embedded in these other two questions, but it's also on its own, what is the value of pyrolysis, right? If we're treating waste, if we're recycling plastics, how much value are we actually ascribing to this? Is it the same as mechanical recycling? Is it more? Is it less? Um, this is a very important question, right? And it's one that policy can both answer explicitly by putting a dollar value on this type of activity or implicitly in the way it's defined. So we're going to be looking at that as well. Okay. Hopefully I've set up the sort of the framework and the key questions. There's four key policy areas I want to highlight. The first is the United Nations level policy, uh, the mouthy international legally binding instrument on plastics pollution, including in the marine environment, a bit of a mouthful. The second is the packaging and packaging waste regulation in the EU. The third is US state level laws and federal agency action. And lastly is actually India's plastic waste management rules. So starting here with the UN, um, this is an image from 2022. This is the moment that the UN signed the binding resolution to create a new plastics framework. You can kind of think of it as a Paris agreement for plastic waste. It's something that is internationally binding. All countries have to uh, sign off on. 
and we'll set overall targets and rules for reducing uh, plastic waste. And we're now deep in the process of making this. We actually have a webinar coming up next month um, centered on the next meeting of this international working group. I won't get too much into the, the guts of that today, but I will say that the potential here is really high. Um, some of the elements of the overall policy uh, you know, documents are, are, are extraordinarily ambitious. You can see here up to and including just reductions on the total amount of plastics produced. Um, but there is a lot of organized resistance. On the left, we have the High Ambition Coalition. This is a group of countries that are pushing for a more ambitious document, including some of those um, powerful uh, sort of restrictions on plastic production. On the right, we have the Global Coalition for Plastic Sustainability. So a group of countries that are pushing for uh, a much more scaled down version of the, the legislation. However, I, I want to emphasize, this is a, a consensus-based process, right? Where a, a small group of countries can really shape the overall outcome. So any policy proposal, any element of this that is going to end up being law or end up being international treaty needs to have a significant level of consensus around it. So where are we seeing that consensus? The answer is extended producer responsibility. This is a legal framework where companies who put you know, products into the market are essentially required to pay a certain amount of money to a producer responsibility organization or a PRO in order to manage. The idea is that the producer pays. The producer of a product or a packaged good pays for the waste management. Um, as opposed to, for example, in America, you know, waste management is a function of municipal government. It's supported by taxes on, you know, the population. EPR has a very broad support in the UN process. Brazil, China, Indonesia, Iran, uh, as well as the United States, Japan, Russia, South Korea. These are a group of countries who don't tend to agree on much, but they all seem to have rallied around EPR as a scheme to support uh, both the disposal and the tracking of, of waste management. Now, there's a lot of stuff that could still occur here, and you know, I encourage you to join our webinar next month if you're interested, but um, many of the most radical elements are seemingly off the table at this point, but there could still be opportunities for uh, you know, funding for cleanup and restrictions on incineration. But um, what does this mean? The highest level, the most international level, the UN, they're not really choosing to answer the question of pyrolysis being recycling. Uh, to the extent that they have tried to answer it, it seems like they're coming down on the level of no, but I think we're probably not going to get a definition there. However, we are going to get, a, I think, a significant push for extended producer responsibility on a member country level. And it's still going to be up to the member countries to set the value of pyrolysis. But this is important. We are moving towards a more unified framework for tracking waste management and tracking the the output of countries or of companies, you know, in the next, I would say, three to five years. So by 2028, we could see a lot more widespread EPR. Now, let's move to the EU. Um, very important to note. Under the current definitions of plastic recycling in the EU, uh, plastic pyrolysis is not recycling. Recycling of waste does not include energy recovery or materials to be used as fuel. So the fact that plastic pyrolysis produces a significant amount of oil, um, the fact that it burns a significant amount of plastics to actually power the process, all of that falls afoul of the EU's definitions of recycling. However, there is a bill that is being you know, almost, I would say, passed uh, right now at the EU level, the Packaging and Packaging Waste uh, Reduction Act. Um, it sets some very ambitious targets for plastic waste reduction. So how can we actually change the products themselves to reduce the amount of uh, packaging? 10% you know, by 2030, up to 20% by 2040. And it improves, uh, does a, a lot of effort to improve collection targets. 
ninety percent by twenty twenty nine. They're going to institute a deposit return scheme, a couple other you know, more mixed sorting of waste, some really good stuff in there. But the important thing is that it seems like we are moving towards acceptance of mass balancing for um, different approaches, including for plastic pyrolysis. And this is actually evolving, you know, day to day as we're recording this webinar, as we're, we're, we're giving this webinar right now. Um, the reality is that, you know, we, we just actually got some breaking news. Um, it seems like we're moving towards particularly a fuel exempt uh, type of mass balance, which is not as permissive as the the free attribution mass balance that the chemicals industry was was pushing towards. But I want to emphasize any adoption of mass balance in the EU is a significant step forward um, because it gives you know the chemical companies and the plastic pyrolysis producers a framework through which to make claims and to really validate their uh, their approach. So. You know, the EU historically has been been relatively hostile to plastic pyrolysis, but the PPWR could actually create a much more favorable regime. So is plastic pyrolysis recycling? Not today, but soon. It seems like it will get some of that role. There is uh, going to be mass balancing as the way to track and accept, uh, you know, the, the waste management that's happening. And this could potentially allow the um, pyrolysis producers to access the tax of 80 uh, euro cents uh, euros on per kilogram on unrecycled plastic. Basically, in the EU, we have a recycled content target. If you fail to meet it, you have to pay a tax. You can't use plastic pyrolysis derived products to meet that uh, target today. In the future, you sh it seems likely that you'll be able to. And that creates a very specific value for uh, material produced via plastic pyrolysis. So we're actually getting here a fairly comprehensive and fairly positive set of answers from the EU, despite the fact that they've been very, very hostile to plastic pyrolysis in the past. Let's now uh, move to the, the good old US of A. Um, the United States, you know, land of freedom, right? And as such, <laughs> it's a total mess. We don't have have in any kind of comprehensive regulation on recycling, on waste management. This is all done at a state and even a municipal level. Um, so we have seen a handful of state level actions to adopt, for example, extended producer responsibility schemes, which we talked about previously in California and Colorado and Maine and Oregon. Um, there's been a number of proposals in the works for many other states. So we expect this to, to spread. However, when you look at the states and facilities with significant uh, large scale pyrolysis facilities that are either planned or maybe just now turning on, they're in states without this type of policy. So in America, plastic pyrolysis is really scaling in the absence of policy, not because of strong policy support. And this is important um, the way that you know America regulates recycling. We regulate recycling as claims. And this is an important point. I'll come back to that later. Um, you know, we had more successes, I would say, than than failures. Um, we had tire recycling programs, you know, specific EPRs for specific products. Uh, we had more and more foam container bans, but um, you know, still some some notable failures. So you know, we are seeing these state level laws progress, right? But the big thing that could really um, change is the Federal Trade Commission, um, the FTC. As I mentioned, um, they regulate the kind of claims that you can make about a product. So if you claim that your product is 100% recycled plastic, that's actually a an advertising claim that gets regulated by the FTC. They have these green guides, which are basically terms that are regulated. You have to meet a specific definition if you use that term in, in your advertising. But there are lots of terms that are currently undefined, like circular, renewable, sustainable, mass balanced. And these terms are pretty widely used already by many companies, McDonald's, you know, some of the chemical companies scaling up pyrolysis. And, you know, I know from the conversations I've been having that these terms are 
you know, being worked on and we're going to get a new set of definitions. Um, I believe in concert with the ASTM to actually sort of really put some structure around what this means. Um, so this could be disruptive for companies using mass balancing, you know, if those existing practices don't align with the new definitions. This could be good, though. This could be validating, right? Um, but importantly, this doesn't do something very, you know, this, this, this doesn't set a value on plastic paralysis, right? When you say, um, hey, we are, are meeting the definition of, of plastic paralysis, you aren't going to get in trouble legally for making that claim. Uh, it's not false advertising. But how much people are going to be willing to pay for it is still totally up in the air, right? Um, and an important element is that it's different from recycled. We'll come back to this, but uh, you know that's a real significant uh, potential roadblock here. So no clear definitional change on recycling. Um, it seems like we're still relying on these third-party certifications for tracking and management. No clear national level or even state level. I mean, in some states, we may have an EPR scheme, but that's not widespread yet. And in terms of value, it's just whatever you can get people to pay for it. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's not likely that the U.S. becomes more favorable to uh, plastic pyrolysis going forward because the favorability of the U.S. is mostly due to the fact that there's sort of a regulatory vacuum. And lastly, I want to target... India, talk about India, because I think Southeast Asia um, and the developing economies in general are a little underserved in this in this discussion. There's a sense that they just are going to follow what the West does or follow the EU. And I think that's that's not exactly correct. India has some extraordinarily robust, well, extraordinarily aggressive, I should say, uh, plastic waste rules. Um, you can see these, they've defined four categories of packaging. I'm not going to go through them, but just know that this basically applies to almost every type of plastic packaging on the market. And you can see that their near-term target is 30% uh, recycled content. And um, their long-term targets are 60 to 80% recycled content. Now, current recycling rates are probably somewhere around 8%. But what's important about here, about this, is that this is really going to create a set of values that can help avoid the mismanagement of waste, right? India and a lot of uh, developing countries have a significant informal waste collection center uh, ecosystem, you know, where um, individuals, pickers will go through, um, collect waste, either, you know, either collect it or recover it from landfills. And without strong drivers for recycling, strong values for recycling, and strong penalties um, for mismanagement, there is a very significant economic incentive to mismanage waste. You know, one example here is individuals setting fires in landfills to burn away plastic to get to more valuable metal, right? And that has a lot of negative uh, environmental sort of impacts. So, you know, within part of what India is doing within this new legislation is it not just sets uh, these recycling content targets, but it also defines a number of different tiers of sort of priority, right? With the top being recycling, but then end of life disposal being a important a sort of category, right? The Indian government wants waste to be properly disposed as opposed to mismanaged. And what's interesting is that India has actually called out or defined uh, pyrolysis, you can see here as waste oil, as one of the viable end of life disposal options. Um, so the way that this is going to work is that, you know, municipalities are going to put requirements on the businesses operating in those areas to ensure that their products are going to be, you know, disposed of appropriately in accordance to the law. And one of those defined routes is plastic pyrolysis. So this could drive a significant volume of waste uh, from landfill and from other applications as you know, to plastic pyrolysis. Um, however, it's not recycling, right? There's a very clearly defined recycling tier in the legislation. Pyrolysis is end of life disposal. It's something else entirely. Um, there's going to be a lot of local and municipal level um, tracking and control and validation of the waste management here, um, as opposed to something more like a, a national EPR. 
And the value of that pyrolysis is still pretty unclear. But I think there is some value going to be attached to it because proper waste management is an important policy outcome. And there will be, I think, incentives to ensure that waste does flow into these types of, of systems as opposed to into the more uh, into the, the category of mismanagement. OK, We've seen a lot of different things. I think it's very important to state up front, we are not moving towards global recognition of pyrolysis as recycling, right? There's not a lot of momentum at the UN level for that. There's not a lot of level for any type of national legislation at the United States level. States aren't really moving towards recognizing pyrolysis as recycling. And India has clearly carved out a role for pyrolysis that isn't recycling, right? It's actually just the EU that has really made positive steps towards recognizing pyrolysis and pyrolysis derived plastics. And this is really important. If you look at the EU, in terms of depolymerization, another alternative advanced recycling technology, it actually leads the rest of the world or has roughly the same amount of capacity as the rest of the world put together. Um, the EU is really a very favorable place to build advanced recycling because it has the infrastructure in terms of collection and in terms of transport and also in terms of off takers. There's a pretty significant chemical industry. But you can see that pyrolysis lags because of these regulatory issues. But with this type of new favorable policy, we could really see a significant expansion in pyrolysis capacity in the EU. A million tons easily would just catch it up to the rest of the world. So we're actually, we could really see a flip from the EU lagging in pyrolysis to the EU being a plastic pyrolysis leader. And this is especially important because, as I mentioned, the EU is probably the only region that could have a defined value for plastic pyrolysis, you know, with that tax on unrecycled waste. In the United States, as an alternative, um, we really have to rely on being able to charge some kind of green premium. And that's going to be very, very difficult. If you look at um, this maturity curve, and this is from our, our Motive AI uh, platform, which assesses the level of, you know, I would say, consumer awareness and how consistently consumers are sort of viewing a, a topic. You can see consumers have a much higher level of awareness and a much higher level of consensus around concepts like recycled packaging and paper packaging, right? They're aware of those. They have a pretty consistent meaning in the mind of a consumer. Whereas recycling and especially pyrolysis um, don't have a significant level of consensus. So without that consensus, it's very difficult to sell, excuse me, to sell a product based on those types of concepts. I think a lot of companies in the US are gonna struggle to get a green premium for uh, pyrolysis because consumers just don't know what it is. And importantly, it's not the same as recycling. This could create an opportunity for a next generation pyrolysis technology. Um, there's a number of different approaches here. Uh, you can you know, use a catalyst, for example, to move directly to a polymer precursor. And that basically is a type of regulatory arbitrage, right? You're changing the technology to much more closely meet the definition of recycling. And that will allow you to say, oh, this is recycling because we're going from this chemical basically back to this chemical. We're not producing any fuels, right? This type of uh, claim is a lot more salient to consumers. But all of these technologies are much earlier stage, and I'd say much more risky than the established or more conventional pyrolysis that produces oil. So there's still a big question here if you can really make this type of thing work. Companies then need to build a strategy that includes a pretty wide range of options, right? Waste logistics, mechanical recycling, because pyrolysis is not going to be legally accepted as recycling outside of the, potentially outside of the EU. And you see that companies are already beginning to do this. Um, Borealis, Lionel Basel are both strengthening their supply chain for waste management as a whole, as well as investing directly in mechanical recycling. And that's going to both position them better to succeed with the circular economy as a whole, as well as specifically with pyrolysis. And that brings us to, I think, our the last point. What, what is the right role? What, you know, what, is, what does this mean for pyrolysis and where should pyrolysis fit? And I think the reality is just that plastic pyrolysis is not a great technology for making recycled plastics. It's just very challenging. The yields are fundamentally very low. 
And so this idea of, you know, a circular economy based on plastic pyrolysis doesn't make a lot of sense. You're burning a lot of that uh, material. You are producing a lot of fuel. And I think we should embrace that. Um, there are a number of hard to decarbonize sectors that could really rely on that fuel. Um, and we want to be reducing our total reliance on extraction of, of fossil resources. We want to reduce the total amount of fossil resources we're producing. And so plastic pyrolysis could form a sort of loop-the-loop -loop economy, right? <laughs> Where you are taking HDPE, LDPE, these lower quality wastes, and you are converting them into pyrolysis oil, not for further plastic production, but for marine fuel. And this has a lot of advantages. It's a lot easier uh, technically to do. Um, producing crackable oil is quite, quite challenging. Um, you actually retain most of the energy. It's not that much worse than mechanical recycling. Um, and it is a lot more, I think, easy to scale. You don't need to have the same regulatory compliance. You don't need to have the same um, you know, alternatives. And we do need to get away from incineration. And a well-managed pyrolysis approach could offer meaningful carbon emissions reductions uh, against incineration while still, you know, solving the issue of uh, a hard to decarbonize sector, especially because the electricity, the power produced by incineration is getting less value. The more green electricity you put on the grid, the less we care about that, you know, electricity and low grade heat. So converting plastic waste, not into electricity, but into a fuel could actually be a lot more valuable over time. Now, this doesn't solve the chemicals industry problem, but I think it's the most sensible role for plastic pyrolysis. Okay, with that, you know, we can expect a global rollout of EPR schemes, but don't count on the global definition of, of recycling to changing to include pyrolysis, right? Second key takeaway, we might see a big flip. The EU has sort of historically been the most hostile region to plastic pyrolysis, but in the next few years, it could become really the center of a plastic pyrolysis renaissance. And, you know, I think chemical companies really need to continue to expand and double down on mechanical recycling and logistics, um, as well as some of the advanced technologies, because the best role for plastic pyrolysis is probably not as a recycling technique, but as a technique for producing fuels. So with that, I want to just say thank you. Um, open it up for questions. I'm sure we have some questions here. And um, yeah, yeah, appreciate your time. Indeed, we do. Thanks, uh, thanks, Anthony, and thanks for uh, for everyone one listening in and uh, and sending in questions. Uh, we do have a few, and time to time to take a couple anyway. Um, you talked a lot about the role of EPR schemes and how, especially, I think, thanks to the UN, it's going to become a, a bigger factor. Do the EPR schemes really drive a difference between pyrolysis and mechanical recycling or, or other sorts of, of solutions in terms of waste management? Like, does that advantage pyrolysis in, in, in any way? I don't necessarily think it advantages pyrolysis in any particular way. But what I will say is that EPR schemes are one of the important ways we can drive plastic collection rates overall, right? We just... Yeah. For plastic pyrolysis, it's highly dependent on having large-scale facilities, You know, at least 100,000, ideally 200 to 400,000 tons per year. And you need that because that makes the process a lot more energy efficient, and that reduces your carbon emissions such that you can actually make a credible, credible claim against um, something like incineration, that it's more sustainable. So you really need a large-scale collection and sortation of plastic wastes in order to actually achieve that type of large scale plastic pyrolysis, uh, you know, sort of operation. So EPR, I, I wouldn't say it necessarily benefits the, on a clay side pyrolysis more, but pyrolysis is much more dependent on having that large scale collection than mechanical recycling, which works really well at small scales at local levels. So without EPR, without large scale collection, um, you're just not going to be able to supply the level of plastic waste that's needed. That's why, you know, I, I didn't get too much into this, but the deposit return scheme in Europe is also very important. Those two factors, like EPR, yeah. DRS, are really crucial for for driving total uh, total collection rates up to a level that can support pyrolysis. Yeah. And 
time for one more. I think you touched on this a little bit in uh, in the the loop de loop riff there, but uh, <laughs> you know, you talked about this the role of pyrolysis mostly in terms of managing plastic waste. But what mm -hmm. role do you think it, it plays in terms of uh, being a source of carbon feedstock? Yeah, I think that can potentially be important. Um, the challenge is that the quality of the carbon feedstock is highly variable. It really depends on the quality of the input material. Um, so there's a real tension between the two desires we have, which is to manage the mixed, you know, and low quality plastic wastes that we have in the ecosystem and to produce a carbon feedstock, right? Um, those things are very much in tension with each other. So I, I think that it will provide a um, some carbon feedstocks for the chemicals industry going forward. But I think that in a lot of cases, it's going to be either not worth the effort on the collection, the upstream side, or not worth the, collect the effort on the downstream processing side to actually try and convert it into a usable uh, chemical feedstock. And so, you know, making sure that we address um, these other applications like marine is, is important. Yeah. And this is one thing where technology, you know, I, I talked about conventional pyrolysis versus some of these advanced approaches. And this is something where some of these advanced approaches could really, uh, you know, make a, a significant impact, right? If you're able to produce, you know, a yield of 60% BTX, right, from a ton of plastic waste in your pyrolysis process, as opposed to having to go through the whole cracking, um, that's a much more attractive carbon feedstock for the chemicals industry, of course, than this sort of mixed low quality oil, right? So this is a place where maybe in, by 2035, we could have a much more viable source of carbons here uh, from plastic waste. All right. Well, that's that's about all we have time for. It's a lot of lot of great great info in there, and uh, I'm sure people will want to refer back to the slides, which they will be able to do because uh, we will send the copy of the presentation and recording to uh, to all the attendees by email. Uh, you should get that later on today. Um, immediately, though, as you leave the webinar, you will get a prompt to complete a survey on the presentation. Uh, we really really appreciate that. Any feedback that you you have, we we look at those closely and use those to. Uh, to inform and improve uh, our future webinars. And uh, speaking of future webinars, we have, uh, have a good one coming up on, on digital agriculture for sustainable consumer packaged goods. Uh, so uh, check that out. Follow us on social media to get uh, information about other future webinars. Uh, look out for Anthony talking about the latest round of the UN um, plastic waste efforts uh, coming up. Uh, shortly as well in the next couple of months as well and uh yeah thanks again for everyone for joining us and have have a great rest of your day